Hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, discussion session so where we're going to discuss physiology based questions from yesterday's exam. All not the exact questions, though, just the pattern of questions which was asked in NEET PG 2022. So, I'm Dr. Abhirami, a physiology faculty, and I'll be discussing physiology based questions for you. So, let's start with this. So, just wanted to share this with you. So I think uh, most of you would have experienced this when you faced your first question. Yes, the same feel we have. So although most of the questions in uh, yesterday's exam were from clinical side, you would have noticed that most of the medicine, pharmacology, pathology based questions the base was from physiology only. So when I just went through the questions, I found out that only if you have a strong basics of physiology, you will be able to answer those, even those clinical pattern of questions. So we'll see what was the physiology based questions which was asked. So over to the first question, a 65 year old male came to the emergency department with the following ABG reports, pH of 7.2, PCO2 of 80 millimeters of mercury, bicarbonate 40 milliequivalents per liter, diagnose the acid base disorder. So, this is an exactly repeat question from our physiology class. Those who have attended uh, my physiology session in uh, area plexus, you would have uh, clearly uh, done this uh, question well because we had a clear analysis of acid base balance. So, if you can remember, how did I teach you to analyze these questions? First step, look at the pH. Any acid-base disorder, first step is to look at the pH. Any pH less than 7.35, you will diagnose it as acidosis. Any pH more than 7.45, you will diagnose it as alkalosis. So the first step is to diagnose whether the disease is acidosis or alkalosis. So we have done that. Now this patient is suffering from acidosis because pH is less than 7.2. Step number two, look at PCO2, look at bicarbonate. See any acid-based question will have these three values. However, uh, the question is of surgical or medicine or OG based question, you will have these three values, pH, carbon dioxide, bicarbonate. So look at carbon dioxide and look at bicarbonate values. What is the normal carbon dioxide PCO2 value? 40 to 46, 40 millimeters on the arterial side and around 46 millimeters on the venous blood. So the average of 40 to 46. But in this patient, PCO2, partial pressure of carbon dioxide has gone up to 80 millimeters of mercury, which means partial pressure of carbon dioxide has increased. Look at bicarbonate. What is the normal value of bicarbonate around 24 to 25 milliequivalents per liter? In this patient, bicarbonate also has been elevated to 40 milliequivalents per liter. So this is another tip in the question. Any acid-base disorder, both carbon dioxide and bicarbonate will be on the same side. Either both will be elevated or both will be decreased. So this tells you that the patient has an acid-base disorder and also chronically he has gone for compensation. That's why both the values are elevated. So now you have to identify out of these two values, which is the cause of acidosis and which is the compensation. One will be the cause, one will be the compensation. If PCO2 is the cause, bicarbonate will be the compensation. If bicarbonate is the cause, carbon dioxide will be the compensation. So identify which is the cause, which is the compensation. So how will we identify that? So look at PCO2 values. It has increased. What is carbon dioxide? It is a volatile acid. If volatile acid level increases, can it cause acidosis? Yes. So if acid levels are increasing, it will cause acidosis. So now we identified that this is the cause of acidosis in this patient. And I already taught you this. If carbon dioxide is the cause, 
which organ in the body is giving you the trouble two organs which play major role in acid base balance lungs and the kidneys if co2 is distorted it means lung is disturbed so this cause is from the lung if you identify that lung is the cause of this acidosis how will you name that disorder now lung means respiratory so now this is respiratory so it's an respiratory acidosis you have found out this so now what is the compensation two organs that help you in acid base balance lungs and the kidneys if anything is wrong with the lung you will call it as respiratory disease if anything is wrong with the kidney you will call it as metabolic disease if lung is giving you the trouble kidneys will compensate that is called renal compensation so any respiratory disease will be associated with renal compensation over time to maintain the ph kidneys will start to compensate that is called renal compensation so look at this patient respiratory acidosis with respiratory acidosis means lung is giving you the trouble So who will compensate kidneys will compensate that is called renal compensation as a result of this renal compensation now how has the kidney compensated body is in acidosis what is the role of kidneys in acid base balance so kidney is handling this bicarbonate the base there so what is the role of this kidney almost 90% of the bicarbonate is reabsorbed from the proximal convoluted tubule so the kidneys are helping you in reabsorption of this bicarbonate so if body is in acidosis it means more acidity is there what the kidneys will do it will compensate by reabsorbing more and more of bicarbonate why is it reabsorbing more and more of bicarbonate yes to neutralize the acidity in the body to neutralize the acidosis kidneys will start to reabsorb more and more of bicarbonate so as a result of this compensation bicarbonate levels will elevate in the body so that is why bicarbonate has elevated so the cause for this increase in bicarbonate is renal compensation so that is why we diagnose this patient with respiratory acidosis with renal compensation the acid base disorders a very important topic even in last year neat exam almost 6 to 7 questions from acid base disorder so you should be very thorough with the concept on if you know the step wise approach to acid base disorders no more it will be a difficult topic for you so this is the protocol look at the ph any ph less than 7.35 acidosis more than 7.45 alkalosis look at carbon dioxide look at bicarbonate identify which is the cause which is the compensation if carbon dioxide is the cause that is called respiratory disease if bicarbonate is the cause that is called metabolic disease all respiratory diseases over time will have renal compensation all metabolic diseases over time they will have respiratory compensation so the answer for this question is c respiratory acidosis with renal compensation Yes, I was so happy to uh, see that this question was asked from our notes from our idea lectures workbook. Uh, to be very precise, page number one eighty five, we have exactly discussed the same question there, so same concept there. Yes, those of you who had attended the class, I think you would have been very happy to see this question. See, not only this question, as we are discussing, uh, you see that. almost all questions in physiology were from our physiology class and the workbook uh, details which are given to you already so i was really happy to see that so most of the students uh, who have benefited from the class so happy for that so question number 2 a diabetic patient falls asleep with one arm under the head when he awakens he has tingling sensation numbness something like that was given what is the reason for this this question also from our workbook page number 10 so we had discussed the nerve fiber susceptibility according to erlanger and gasser classification of nerve fibers there are three types of nerve fibers type a type b type c a fibers they are more susceptible to pressure and local anesthetic 
B fibers more susceptible to hypoxia. C fibers least susceptible. So what does this mean? Susceptibility means if there is a pressure, pressure sensation, A fiber will be first affected. If you give local anesthesia to a patient, A fibers will be first affected. Similarly, when there is lack of oxygen, B fibers will be first affected. C fibers, least susceptible to all. See, there's always a controversial thing here regarding local anesthetic and the C fiber. So it's no more a controversy because according to even the latest edition of Yenong, it says that C fibers are only more susceptible to local anesthetic. So that is according to even the latest Yenong, <coughs> but we're not going with that because According to Miller's textbook of anesthesia, this is actually an anesthesia question. So according to anesthesia, the textbook tells you that A fibers are only more susceptible to local anesthetic. So it's no more a controversy. Answer is A for local anesthetic. So look at this question. A patient is sleeping like this. So there is pressure sensation. When he is <coughs> waking up, he has numbness. A fibers are more susceptible, more sensitive to pressure than C fibers. That is the reason for this numbness. The answer is A. Third question. Cell A connects with cell B through a chemical messenger as given in the image. Identify the mechanism. So look at this image. <coughs> so look at this image. This is cell A. This is cell B. Some substances are released here. What are those substances released? Chemical messengers. chemical messengers or neurotransmitters. So what is this type of thing happening here? So this is also from our workbook, page number 141. So we have already discussed this. There are three types of actions. Autocrine means a cell produces some substance. It's on the same cell. For example, beta cells, they produce insulin, Insulin can act on the same cell. So this is called autocrine action. Paracrine action. A cell produces some chemical messengers. For example, the ACL-like cells, enterochromaffin-like cells, they produce histamine, the chemical messenger, histamine. Histamine acts on the nearby cell. <clears throat> See, anywhere in the body, para means what? Parasympathetic. Paranuclei, anything para means nearby or next to. So this paracrine action, histamine acts on the nearby cell or the next cell, which is the parietal cell. And therefore, parietal cell produces increased hydrochloric acid. So this is an example for paracrine action. If a gland or a cell is producing a substance, that is acting on the nearby cell, para. That is called paracrine action. Endocrine action. What is endocrine action? If a gland produces a substance or a chemical substance or a hormone, for example, let's say the anterior pituitary, this produces growth hormone. This is released into the blood, into the circulation. It goes throughout the circulation to the muscles and the bones, even to the distant cells and increases the growth. So this is called endocrine action. So the question that was asked, A cell and B cell, nearby cells. So it is a paracrine action. The answer is A, paracrine action. Fourth question, mechanism of action of botulinum toxin. What is this botulinum toxin? Yes, this also we have clearly discussed in our class. 
It's there in the workbook, page number 42, where we discuss about the neuromuscular junction. What are the events happening in the neuromuscular junction? And what is the mechanism of action of Clostridium botulinum? So quickly, we'll recap that. So let's say this is a neuron. And let's say this is a muscle. So the junction between this neuron and the muscle, this is called as neuromuscular junction, NMJ. So what are the events that happen in the neuromuscular junction? So starting from the neuron, that is opening up of voltage gated sodium channels. And there is entry of sodium. Whenever you have sodium, you will have action potential being developed. So that is action potential. This action potential travels along the neuron, reaches the axon terminal. At the axon terminal, you have calcium channels. Third step, opening of calcium channels. Calcium enters inside. Wherever in the body you have calcium, calcium will produce a constricting effect, a contraction effect, or a movement. This is the role of calcium. So here it's going to cause a movement. So what is the movement? This calcium is going to move the vesicles. So these are the vesicles containing acetylcholine. They are moved into the presynaptic terminal. And they are going to release acetylcholine. So for these vesicles to move, you need certain proteins. So for this step, you need some proteins. They're called as snare proteins. Snare proteins. What are the snare proteins? Synapto, tagmin, synapto, brevin, syntaxin, snap 25. So these are the snare proteins. What is the role of snare proteins? To move these vesicles containing acetylcholine to the terminal and release the acetylcholine. Now this step is blocked by, or the snare proteins are blocked by Clostridium botulinum. There are many subtypes of Clostridium botulinum, but all of them block these snare proteins. If this step is blocked, Acetylcholine cannot be released. So Clostridium botulinum, the mechanism of action is it blocks these snare proteins, therefore blocks the release of acetylcholine, the neurotransmitter. So look at this question. Mechanism of action of botulinum toxin inhibits the release of acetylcholine from the synapse. Because Clostridium botulinum, it will block snare proteins. Snare proteins are important for recycles to move and release acetylcholine. So this step is blocked. So this is about Clostridium botulinum. So what is the clinical presentation of Clostridium botulinum? If it blocks the snare proteins, the movement of this recycle and opening of the recycle to release acetylcholine, that is blocked. So ultimately, acetylcholine release is blocked. What is the role of acetylcholine? It acts on the muscle, the nicotinic receptors on the muscle, thereby causes muscle contraction. So if acetylcholine is blocked, no effective muscle contraction. So all muscles become very flaccid. That is called flaccid paralysis. Flaccid paralysis. So Clostridium botulinum causes flaccid paralysis. So this is exactly in contrast to Clostridium tetani. Clostridium tetani, the mechanism of action is it blocks the inhibitory neurotransmitters. Inhibitory neurotransmitters, GABA and glycine. See, if GABA and glycine are blocked, both are inhibitory neurotransmitters. So this is blocked. So now there is nobody to inhibit. Therefore, 
acetylcholine increases more the acetylcholine more the muscle contraction when you have increased muscle contraction that is called spastic state so this is called spastic paralysis see exactly opposite to botulinum botulinum is flaccid paralysis no muscle contraction tetany is spastic paralysis all muscles will go for hyper contraction especially if it affects the muscles of the jaw that is called locked jaw so that's the difference between botulinum and tetanus toxin question number 5 there was a question related to uh, mechanisms for aging and i think these were the options so what are the mechanisms for aging see there are two different uh, things happening aging longevity how some people become older very earlier itself and how some people are able to live for a longer period of life so two different mechanisms so mechanism for aging so what are the mechanisms for aging free radical theory free radical theory you have so many free radicals produced in the body so that will cause cell death limitations in cell division after a particular point of time the cells will stop dividing that's called limitation in cell division telomere shortening so telomere shortening is every time the cell divides it will get the, there's a cutting of this and it's and this is called telomere shortening so cell becomes shorter and shorter and shorter and after one point it will stop dividing so that is called telomere shortening and this is actually a nobel prize discovery discovered by helen carroll and jack a nobel prize discovery for telomere shortening so these are the mechanisms by which people become older it's called mechanism of aging so the mechanisms for aging includes so what is the answer for this telomere shortening a nobel prize discovery then what are these sirtuin and red wine see sirtuin pathway is one pathway by which people are able to live for a longer period so it's a mechanism of longevity it's not a mechanism of aging similarly red wine people who drink red wine or people who eat lot of grapes so all this red wine and grapes it contain it contains resveratrol which will help you to increase or enhance the sirtuin pathway so both are mechanisms of longevity both are mechanisms of longevity telomere shortening is mechanism of aging yes so this was also exactly from our uh, workbook we have already discussed this it's on page number 141 where we discussed about the mechanisms of aging question number 6 something related to an acromegaly patient i think and uh, treatment of choice so what is acromegaly related to growth hormone the growth hormone is completely under the control of hypothalamus so what is the role of hypothalamus how hypothalamus affects growth hormone levels the hypothalamus it can produce two different types of hormones growth hormone inhibitory hormone which is called somatostatin which will inhibit the growth on the other side growth hormone releasing hormone which will increase the growth so this decreases growth hormone levels this increases growth hormone levels so hypothalamus has dual effect on growth hormone it can increase the growth hormone or decrease the growth hormone decreasing the growth hormone is because of somatostatin so the drug form of somatostatin is octreotide so now can you guess for which disease you can use this octreotide it is an analog of somatostatin something which acts like somatostatin which will decrease the growth hormone level 
So on in patients who have increased growth hormone levels, you can treat them by giving somatostatin analog, which is octreotide. Therefore, their growth hormone levels will come down. So it's used in the treatment of acromegaly. So the right option was acromegaly. Acromegaly patient, octreotide. Yes, this also we had discussed in our workbook, page number 199. Exactly the same concept we had discussed. Question number seven. Something related to this ECG, a clinical scenario and the diagnosis. Look at the ECG here. You can see abnormal T waves here. So they're called tall T waves. What is the underlying uh, physiology of this tall T waves? So first of all, let's learn the waves of ECG. P wave, QRS and T wave. And P wave is because of atrial contraction. QRS is due to ventricular contraction or you can say P wave is because of uh, atrial depolarization which will result in contraction. QRS is because of ventricular depolarization, which would result in ventricular contraction. And T wave is because of ventricular repolarization. See, whenever a part of the heart repolarizes, it means it is going to relax. Or you can say ventricular relaxation. So this ventricular repolarization if you can remember the action potential curves, it has depolarization, repolarization. So this upstroke is called depolarization. This downstroke is called repolarization. If you can remember <coughs> the events, ionic basis beyond uh, of this depolarization and repolarization. Depolarization is due to sodium influx. Influx means sodium is moving inside. Repolarization is because of potassium efflux. Efflux means potassium is moving outside. So you find that there is a relation between repolarization and potassium. There's also a relation between T wave and repolarization. So that is why you find abnormal T waves when you have abnormalities in potassium ion concentration. T wave abnormalities are related to potassium ion concentrations. So what are the abnormalities? You have two types of potassium abnormalities. Hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia means increased concentration of potassium and hypokalemia, less of potassium. This is increased K plus, this is decreased K plus. Since T wave is due to repolarization, that is due to potassium, hyperkalemia will result in tall T waves. Look at the morphology of this hyperkalemic tall T waves. Okay, these are the waves. So they are tall, narrow, pointed, peak, tented with a narrow base. See, look at the morphology. Typically, they will look like a tall tent. So that is hyperkalemic tall T waves. There's one differential diagnosis for tall T waves. Myocardial infarction also produces tall T waves. But you, uh, by looking at the morphology itself, you can differentiate. In hyperkalemia, they are tall, narrow, uh, narrow base pointed and all that. But in myocardial infarction, look at these T waves. They're also tall, but that is called hyperacute T waves. They are tall, they are fat, wide, more blunted peak. They'll have a wide base, blunted peak. So this is tall T waves or myocardial infarction. So differential diagnosis for tall T waves, hyperkalemia, myocardial infarction. What about hypokalemia then? So if hyperkalemia is causing tall T waves, hypokalemia will cause short T waves, or you can say even T wave is inverted and a prominent U wave. 
look at this question. So you are almost seeing tall T waves, which are narrow based, pointed, something like a tent. So this is tented peaked tall T waves seen in hyperkalemia. If it was a broad base and uh, not very pointed, very blunt peak, so then it would be myocardial infarction. So these waves, typically they are hyperkalemic tall T waves. Yes, this also from our exact uh, repeat from the workbook, page number 267, we had discussed this concept of tall T waves and hyperkalemia. Question number eight, which basal ganglia nuclei defect causes hemibalism? Direct question, very easy question. So look at the basal ganglia nucleus. So how will we learn the basal ganglia nucleus? So it has a C-shaped caudate nucleus, a lens-shaped lenticular nucleus. Lenticular nucleus is made up of cutamen, globus pallidus external, globus pallidus internal. Cutamen and caudate, together it is called striatum. Just below the thalamus, subthalamic nucleus. Below subthalamic nucleus, substantia nigra. So these are all the different nuclei of the basal ganglia. And how will we learn the functions and disorders related to basal ganglia? So you will find that basal ganglia plays a very important role in planning and controlling of muscular movements of the body, motor movements of the body. So that is why whenever you have any problem with basal ganglia, it will present as a movement disorder. So all basal ganglia disorders are movement disorders, abnormal involuntary movement disorders. So you can see this pill rolling type of movements, movement of shoulders, movement of the arms, some abnormal movements you will see and all of them are almost like uh, some dance like movements. So depending on which part of the basal ganglia is affected, you give a different name to this movement disorder. So ultimately, all basal ganglia disorders are movement disorders. So we'll see what are they. Any damage to subthalamic nucleus typically presents as hemibalism. Hemibalism. Ballet means ballet dance, something like to dance. So abnormal dance like movement. Any damage to striatum, chorea. Korea, choreography, something related to dance like abnormal movements. Excessive deposition of copper in the lenticular nucleus. So that is called Wilson's disease. Wilson's disease. And any damage to globus pallidus external. Athetosis, that is also a movement disorder. Any damage to chordate. Caudate is related to cognition of the person. So any damage to caudate, his cognition will be affected. There are fibers from substantia nigra to striatum. And these fibers produce dopamine. It's called dopaminergic nigrostriatal pathway. If there is damage to these dopaminergic fibers, common disease. Parkinsonism. Whenever there is a damage to the inhibitory fibers of striatum, the GABA producing GABAergic fibers of striatum, that can also produce Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease. So these are all the disorders related to basal ganglia. Ultimately, all of them are abnormal involuntary dance-like movements. Only the name is different. So back to our question, which basal ganglia nuclei defect results in hemibalism? So what is the answer? Subthalamic nucleus, direct question. Yes, this also we had discussed in our class, page number 45, look at the workbook. So we had discussed about this subthalamic nucleus and hemibalism. Question number nine, true about the cystometrogram. So look at this cystometrogram. It has 
intravesical volume along x axis intravesical pressure along the y axis and what is the systematography so you will ask the patient to void urine and we are going to measure the volume and the pressures so what are the phases initially when few drops of urine is poured into the bladder there will be a small increase in volume will be a small increase in pressure also so that is phase 1a later on when the bladder is slowly filling from 100 ml to 400 ml so there is a change in the volume or you can see there is a change in the radius so there is a change in the radius radius increases so when the radius increases the tension in the bladder will increase that is tension and the law which relates the radius of the bladder to its tension that is called law plus law according to law plus law t is equal to 2t by r pressure is equal to twice the tension or twice the surface tension divided by the radius so it's because of this law plus law that phase 1b radius is increasing surface tension is also increasing both denominator and numerator both are increasing when the bladder is when the bladder is filling therefore pressure remains constant since there is an increase in the denominator and the numerator there is no change in the pressure so the pressure remains constant so that is why throughout this phase 1b as volume is increasing pressure remains constant that is called the plateau phase after 400 ml you can't control automatically there will be a sudden rise in intravesicular pressure there will be sudden maturation sudden rise in intravesicular pressure so you will have a marked sense of fullness when you reach this 400 ml the first urge to void urine that you will feel when bladder is getting filled with around 100 to 150 ml so true about the systematogram uh, we can go with option b 1b is due to law plus law remember same law plus law we will also apply in the alveoli where we learn about surfactant the same law plus law so exactly repeat from our workbook again page number 121 so where we discussed in class about this systematogram law plus law remember the balloon and all i showed you yes question number 10 Baro receptors for blood pressure act through which mechanism? Direct question. So, what are the control systems present in the body? There are two types of control systems: feedback control system, feed forward control system. What is feedback control system? So, in feedback control system, you have positive feedback. and negative feedback the positive feedback means when you have a stimulus and a response both the stimulus and the response are acting in the same direction stimulus is increasing the response response is increasing the stimulus so this is like a vicious cycle this will continuously keep happening stimulus increases the response response increases the stimulus that is called positive feedback what is negative feedback exactly the opposite when you have a stimulus and a response stimulus and the response are in opposite directions so for example when there is less level of t3 and t4 thyroid hormones are less so this will have a negative feedback on the anterior pituitary and anterior pituitary will produce more tsh thyroid stimulating hormone so stimulus is decreasing response is increasing so stimulus and response act in opposite direction so what are the examples for this all hormones all hormonal mechanisms they follow negative feedback except two hormones which will fall under positive feedback luteinizing hormone oxytocin 
recognizing hormone and oxytocin they will follow recognizing hormone for lh surge oxytocin for milk ejection reflex lactation reflex and parturition reflex so all that is positive feedback except for these two all other hormones are negative feedback another example for negative feedback bp regulation by baroreceptors so what is bp regulation by baroreceptors baroreceptors are located on the arch of aorta and on the carotid arteries so whenever there is an increase in blood pressure so that will stretch these baroreceptors and eventually they will trigger glossopharyngeal and vagus nerve that goes to your brain exactly to the medulla to the nucleus tractus solitarius and it will inhibit the sympathetic system so when sympathetic nucleus is inhibited bp falls so any rise in bp through baroreceptors it causes a fall in bp similarly when there's a fall in bp baroreceptors can cause an increase in bp so this is where the stimulus and the response are in opposite directions again example for negative feedback yes this also we have discussed in our class page number 127 on our workbook we had discussed the examples for negative feedback about baroreceptors also so question number 11 a patient has altered consciousness irregularly irregular pulse with a deficit or pulse deficit of more than 20 which of the following can be seen in his jvp so this is a clinical based question with physiological basis irregularly irregular pulse with pulse deficit more than 20 so the diagnosis would be atrial fibrillation af so what happens in af irregularly irregular rhythm high heart rates so in atrial fibrillation what is the change in jvp So what is JVP first of all? Jugular venous pulse or jugular venous pressure. So we are going to record the pressure in the internal jugular vein. So that is called JVP. Why are we choosing the internal jugular vein? Because it is in direct communication with the right side of the heart. So you can say that if you record the pressures in the internal jugular vein, we are actually recording the pressures in the right atrium. Both are same. So it's an indirect method of measuring the pressures in the right atrium. So this is the method of measuring JVP two scale method. It's called the two scale method. So we are going to place two scales, one over the sternal angle, and ask the patient to turn to the left side, put him in forty five degrees. You can see the highest point of pulsations JVP. So you take the second ruler and you join the first and connect the first and the second rulers. So at this point exactly, measure how many centimeters from the sternal angle. So that is called as your JVP. So you will denote JVP as how many centimeters from the sternal angle. Normally, it is three to four centimeters from the sternal angle. And we assume that the right this is only from the sternal angle, but right atrium is deep inside. So from the sternal angle, right atrium inside it's another. Five centimeters below the sternal angle. So, if you take an average, uh, if you take the sum of these both, four centimeters from the sternal angle, five centimeters below, so that will give you around nine centimeters. So, JVP can be denoted in two ways. You can say it as four centimeter from the sternal angle, correct. Nine centimeter from the right atrium inside, that is also correct. So, which will correspond to a pressure of seven millimeters of mercury. So, elevated JVP means more than four centimeter above the sternal angle. If you connect the two scales, it is measuring more than four centimeters from the sternal angle. That is called elevated JVP. So, what are the waves that you see in JVP? So, what is that easy method to learn the waves of JVP? So, JVP waves you can correlate it with the right atrial events. Because JVP is a recording of right atrial pressures, so take only the right atrial events. A wave in JVP indicates atrial contraction. A for atrial contraction. When atrium is contracting, you see A wave. 
C wave in JVP indicates C for movement of tricuspid valve. X wave in JVP indicates X for atrial relaxation. V wave in JVP, V for atrial venous filling. Y wave in JVP, Y for atrium emptying. So this is the physiological basis of these waves that we see. What are the abnormalities in the waves? Yes, exactly. This also we had discussed in the workbook on page number 241. So we discussed about the abnormalities of the A waves. So look at A wave. What is A wave due to? A for atrial contraction. So when will you have large A waves? So think logically. A wave means right side. It's a wave of atrial contraction and especially of the right atrium, right side of the heart. Whenever there is an increased pressure on the right side of the heart, you will have increased A wave. Obviously, you know, because A wave is corresponding to atrial contraction. When will the atrium contraction be more pronounced? When there is more pressure in the right side of the heart. What are the conditions where you can have increased pressure on the right side of the heart? Tricuspid stenosis, if this valve is stenosed, between the right atrium and the right ventricle, tricuspid valve, if that is blocked, stenosed, pressure will rise. So more the contraction, A wave will become larger. Pulmonary stenosis, pulmonary valve is also present on the right side of the heart. So pulmonary stenosis also can increase atrial contraction, more pronounced. Right atrial myxoma, you have a growth or a tumor on the right side of the heart. So that will again raise the pressure of the right side so large A waves. Pulmonary hypertension, directly increased pressure on the right side of the heart, that will increase atrial contraction, bigger A waves. So when the atrium is contracting against high pressures, it will produce large A waves. Absent A waves, when will you not see an A wave? The A wave is due to atrial contraction. So if heart is beating like this, 72 beats per minute, Contraction, relaxation, contraction, relaxation. You will see proper A waves because it is contracting properly. What is atrial fibrillation? High heart rates, atrium is irregularly irregular. It is beating at a high irregular state. So it will be fibrillating like this. So when the heart is fibrillating like this, can you have any proper contraction? No, because it is vibrating like this. So there's no proper contraction. When you don't have proper contraction, you will not see a proper A wave. So that is why absent A waves in atrial fibrillation. Yes, the answer for this question is in AF, absent A waves. Yes, come to the end of the session. Thank you so much. And one nice uh, meme that I came across, I wanted to share with you. So whatever you have done in your exams, so exams are over. You cannot change anything more. So don't get depressed, suppressed and all that. So feel happy. You should be on two ways. If you get your post-graduation seat, happily you will go to your post-graduation. If not, if there's something is happening, don't worry. Your success or happiness, anything, can always be delayed. It can never be denied. If not this exam, there are always so many exams coming up. You'll definitely do in that. So don't worry thinking about the wrong answers. Always think you have a very great life ahead. More than all these exams, you have a big, beautiful view waiting for you there. So don't worry too much about these exams. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, in case if we have missed some questions or something, any options, you can post in the comment box. So I'll be happy to solve that. Thank you so much. We'll finish our session with this. Thanks to ADR for arranging this. Thank you so much, sir.